Welcome to FaceTime Fly Fishing. I am your host, Eric Straup. Glad you could join us today. It is Thursday, December 4th. Hope everyone's getting ready for the holidays. We had the kids at the mall last night uh, taking the train ride and getting uh, pictures with Santa. Uh, it is the season. So <laughs> hope you're still getting out and getting some fishing done. And if you're at work today, try to look busy for the next 40 minutes. We're going to discuss some fly fishing. Uh, be a part of the show. You can use the Google Plus question answer toggle. Type in a question. Uh, you can also text me at 814-505-4568. And before I get started today, um, just want to make a special note. The fly fishing world lost an icon uh, this past week. On Thanksgiving morning, Thursday of last week, uh, we lost Chris Helm. Uh, <clears throat> if, <coughs> excuse me, anyone who's familiar with Chris knows that uh, when it came to deer hair, he was probably one of the foremost experts in the world. Um, I didn't know Chris all that well. I had met him a few times. Uh, a good friend of the show, Kevin Compton, knew Chris quite well. And uh, it, was, it was sudden and um, Chris had been battling cancer. I do know that. And, uh, but nobody expected this. And so, uh, Chris, you will be missed um, from the fly fishing world. We, we all thank you for your uh, contribution, which was tremendous. I have uh, lots of supplies in my desk that came from Chris Helm's shop. So uh, we're going to miss him. Our latest video to come out uh, was episode 16. If you're not a member of FaceTime Fly Fishing, uh, which is my site, www.ericstraupflyfishing.com. Go on there and take a look at it. We have over 100 videos, all instructional in nature. Um, we just finished a series uh, called 30 Days, and it was 30 days of fishing in the month of October, and uh, every day. So check it out. Episode 16 is out. You can take a look at it. Uh, the, the most notable part of episode 16 is the fly that I lost. I had caught four or five fish right in a row, lost my last pattern, which uh, I didn't know at the time of the filming was called the pocket picker. It was one of, it is one of Kevin Compton's designs. And I have to tell you, it is absolutely deadly. Um, I did last week on this show, 20 flies that you need anywhere, anytime. And uh, I did not include the pocket picker in the list. I included one of other one of Kevin's other patterns, uh, the cinnamon toast pattern, which all the FaceTime members are familiar with. But I am very tempted to stick this pattern in there. I've not fished it on a uh, year long basis. So I don't know. But I can tell you at this time of year, the pocket picker <laughs> is unbelievable. And stay tuned to FaceTime. I was talking to Kevin this morning. Um, it's going to be on the on the uh, website real soon. It is an absolutely tremendous pattern. And in the video, in episode 16, as soon as I leave the water, I am driving to Kevin's shop to get material so I can tie that fly. It is a deadly, deadly pattern. And uh, I absolutely love it. Kevin Compton, by the way, next week for this broadcast, uh, Kevin's going to be on the show. At least that's what it's looking like right now. We were going to try to schedule it for today, but he was behind in order. So um, next week, we're going to have Kevin on. I've gotten lots of questions recently about the barbless hooks and how they compare to uh, conventional hooks, uh, particularly what the uh, ratio is with size. So there's a lot of confusion over that, and there is no conversion chart as of right now. But I was talking to Kevin this morning, and not only is he going to try to put a conversion chart together, but we're, he's going to be here next week for this show, and we're going to discuss it. So um, stay tuned for that and get your questions ready. Remember, you can email me through the week. Um, and if you have a question on barbless hooks, send me an email and we'll make sure to address it 
next week. And you can do that at epstroup at gmail.com. That's E-P-S-T-R-O-U-P at gmail.com. Kevin knows more about barbless hooks and hook design than anyone I know. So if you have a question, uh, don't hesitate to make sure that you get me an email, call me or send me a text either way or Kevin. So um, this show next week should be absolutely dynamite. My apologies for not having the show yesterday in our normal Wednesday time slot. I was at Delco Manning on Tuesday night, the Delco Manning TU, and uh, it was terrific, by the way. Thank you to all those guys. Uh, thanks for coming out. We actually did a, a little talk on, on the uh, website, and I showed a bunch of videos uh, from the site. But um, weather was horrible, and it's funny, this, this, uh, this arrangement for me to go speak there I think is about two years old. And it seems like every time we had a date scheduled, uh, we'd get a weather event and I wouldn't be able to make it down there. And yesterday, or Tuesday rather, was no different. Uh, we had an ice storm hit and I thought, screw it, I'm gonna go. <laughs> I've got a big truck with four wheel drive. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna make it. Well, I did, I made it there, no problem. Uh, coming back was a little bit treacherous and uh, ended up getting home at about 2.30 in the morning. And uh, Wednesday was just out of the question. Yesterday was, I was a, a zombie in the morning yesterday. So um, decided to put the show back until today and uh, hopefully everyone still catches it. We have uh, the vast majority of our, our listeners listen through the week sometime, not live. So I wasn't too concerned about it, but we had a great showing there. Thanks again to all the guys. Uh, I got to get reacquainted with a friend of mine, Tim O'Neill, uh, at O'Neill's Irish Flies, uh, dot com. Tim is a fantastic fly tire, and I just want to make a quick mention for him. Um, he is doing, he is running some fly tying classes through the winter. So if you're down in the southeastern PA, um, Delaware region, check it out. Uh, Tim's website is www.oneillirishflies.com. Check it out. He's got some great classes lined up and uh, give him a shout and, and check it out. It will, will not be uh, a waste of time. I can promise you he's a fabulous fly tire and better than that, he's a good guy. So go, go take advantage of that. Uh, real quick, before we get into our topic, we're going to talk today about hooking, fighting, landing, and releasing trout. And uh, it's always an interesting topic. I have lots of uh, people in the business, uh, professionals, guides, and etc., that listen to the broadcast. If you have anything to add to this, please feel free. Uh, send your comments in to the uh, Google Plus question answer toggle or uh, send me a text. There are lots and lots of opinions on how to do this. And uh, I'm going to share with you some of the observations that I've made over the years. And um, Obviously, the more trout you catch, the more experience you get in this uh, in this realm. So uh, there are lots and lots of opinions. We're going to discuss that. But before I get to that, I want to just touch briefly on last week's show. The last two episodes that we had were on the top 20 flies um, that you need, that I feel that you need anywhere, anytime. And if you have these 20 patterns with you, um, you can catch a trout anywhere, anytime with very, very few exceptions. And um, I wanted to just make mention, uh, if you don't know what that list is, you can go back on the website and look at the other two episodes of this show. But um, So I don't want to go back over the list. But there were a couple of notable patterns, uh, real briefly, that I'd like to touch on, uh, that I've got some comments on that they were not on the list. And probably the most popular uh, that, that people mentioned that they used uh, that wasn't on the list is the Prince Nymph. And I will be the first to admit that princes are dynamite patterns. Um, you can use them all the time. In fact, one of my favorite patterns I put in my common sense book, I call it the Mega Prince, which is just a prince with uh, a tungsten bead. And I wrap some CDC for the collar and it moves a little bit. That's all it is. 
but it's a great pattern. The problem with that pattern and the reason it didn't make my list is because it's a pain to tie. I don't like tying with buy-its. Um, they just take time. And I am not somebody that likes to sit down and just tie flies to tie flies. I, if I, I've often said if I didn't fish, I wouldn't tie flies at all. Um, I don't particularly get enjoyment out of just sitting and tying flies. Occasionally I do, but for the most part, I tie flies because I need them to catch trout. And uh, the prince doesn't make my list because it takes too damn long for me to tie it. Messing with the bites, I just I, it drives me insane. So that's the only reason it wasn't on the list. If I were just buying flies, I, that would be one of them. <laughs> the prince is a great pattern. Uh, the other pattern that, that uh, lots of guys mentioned to me that wasn't on the list is Copper Johns. And it, same thing. They just take me too long to tie, and I don't want to spend the time tying those. I can achieve the same thing um, with, with dubbing, and it's a lot quicker. And quite frankly, you know, what makes the Copper John so effective, in my opinion, is the fact that it gets deep quick. And uh, I can do that with, with my rigs um, without having to go through the tedious tying of the Copper John. Lots of emergers. Uh, I had guys uh, send me emails about different emerger patterns that they have. Um, I guess when it comes to, to fly patterns, I am really old school. Uh, emerging things. If I want to fish an emerger, I fish the nymph at a different level. <laughs> and uh, quite often, as you know, we've talked about it many times on here. Uh, if they're eating something in the film, I'll throw a nymph in the film. Uh, that's just nothing wrong with throwing emergers. They work. Trust me. I fish a lot of soft tackles, and, and uh, but uh, I don't really go out of my way to, to tie specific patterns like that. And I'll be honest, it's it's pretty rare that um, I ever see a stage of insect that uh, is emerging in mass that way. Not to say that the trout won't take it. I mean, they certainly do. Everybody knows that. But um, most often it's, it's one or the other. They're eat, either eating the nymph or the dun, and it's just a matter of where you fish it. And uh, I've found success by just fishing my nymphs higher up in the column or, or right in the film. So um, nothing wrong, certainly nothing wrong with fishing in a merger. They're, they're very effective and, and they do cover a stage of, of the hatch. And then uh, last but not least, uh, guys had mentioned that there are no hatch specific bugs um, in the list. And that's kind of true. And it's mostly because this is a generic uh, inventory. So that if you just have this with you, you can always uh, prepare yourself for a specific hatch. So you can go and uh, if you're going to be on a stream that has uh, green drakes coming off, there's certainly you want to have a few green drakes in your in your arsenal. But this inventory that I that I listed is really something that you just want to keep with you all the time. You'll always be in the game. And quite honestly, in a lot of cases, uh, you can fish what I had on that list in, in lots of hatch situations and do just fine. So um, that's that. Uh, any future or additional questions or comments, please don't hesitate to send them along. I did ask everyone to send a list of their top five flies, and I'm still getting that list. Uh, guys are still sending them to me. So I am going to uh, use that for a show in the future. I thought it was really interesting. And um, the results of that and the, the most popular flies might surprise you. So stay tuned for that. We will move on and we're going to get into our main topic now, which is um, hooking, fighting and landing and releasing trout. And this is, uh, this is always interesting to me uh, as a guide, getting to spend time on the water with lots of different people. Um, you see, all sorts of things. And many of these things we've covered in part in, in this series uh, or in this show rather over the year, over the past year, but we're going to put it all together now. And hooking is really one of the things um, 
you, you see both extremes as a guide. And anybody that guides out there can uh, feel free to chime in here. You see all sorts of things. The most common mistake I see in hooking is sometimes people, especially uh, novice anglers who are, are new to the sport, have a tendency to set the hook in the opposite direction that, that they should. So I don't know why, where that comes from or why it, it is so prevalent, but it's very, very common. Um, the water is drifting a, a direction. The trout is facing that direction. And we're drifting our flies that direction. You want to set with the current. Uh, remembering always that the trout are facing current. That's what they do. So you want to pull the fly into the fish. There is a tendency by lots of anglers to pull the fly in the opposite direction. And I think it comes from uh, the thought that you're just trying to pull uh, resistance. And so you, it might be an instinct to go the opposite direction, but the actual truth is you want to pull with the current. You want to set the hook with the current. So as if you're drifting, uh, as you're looking at it right to left, you want to set into the current, pull the hook into the fish. That is really the most important thing. Now you have different levels of, of guys setting the hook. I see some guys occasionally that they want to use their whole arm to set the hook. Uh, or, or they, uh, they dip the rod tip before they set. It's like they have to get anchored before they rip that hook into the fish. You know, remember, they're just trout. So I always tell guys, you only have to move the hook an inch to set to set it. And that'll drive it home. So the real key to good hook setting is not having so much slack out there that, that um, you don't get a you don't get an immediate movement of that hook. So you don't want to have to move that rod tip very far. And with that said, you don't want to be too tight that that uh, that that you're not getting a drift. So it's very important to have that right balance between just the right amount of slack and um, not too much slack so that you don't have to move very far. You want to only have to move the rod tip to set the hook. And so that is really finding that balance is really key to having a good hook set. The other thing is we're taught to make these huge mends with, with our fly line. And I see this a lot, particularly with guys that are, are nymphing with an indicator. They make their cast, they make a huge mend so that the belly is going, the belly of the fly line is going in the opposite direction of the current pole, which is what they're supposed to do, quote unquote. And when that indicator moves, they set the hook, but the line, the line that's going in the opposite direction of the current, when you set the hook, you will actually pull the fly away from the fish. Um, this is, it's really critical that uh, I talk in common sense fly fishing, uh, a little plug for my book, uh, about a corridor and keeping the, the line and the slack in about a four foot area between the rod tip and the fly. And one of the main reasons for that is so that when you set the hook, the resistance that you're getting from the water and from the current is pretty contained and you have to move less to move the hook. So um, it's very important. Joe Jure says, uh, not just a novice issue. I'm not a novice and I have this problem. It usually happens with the right to left current and being right-handed, the tendency is to hook in the direction the arm is moving. Um, yeah, it makes sense, Joe. I, I think there's just an, uh, an instinct to set with, with resistance. So, um, very, very important that your, uh, your drift and your slack is set up properly to get a good hook set. That is really, really key. And, and very often we talk on this show about putting slack in your leader, not necessarily your fly line. That will help this issue as well. When you just have slack in the leader, it's there's no resistance there. So as soon as you move that rod tip, that fly is going to move. And that's, that's really important. Um, 
remember a fish can pick the fly up spit it out uh, without you ever seeing it it happens immediately and uh, all they have to do is open their mouth accept the fly and once they realize it's a fraud they simply close their gills and push all the water out of their mouth and it's game over you don't get the hook in them so you've got to be quick and uh, you know this is for another episode setting yourself up so that you can see that stop in the flies immediately that's uh that's key but for the hook set remember to hook into the fish set the hook into the fish any other comments keep them coming um fighting fish this one is uh we could talk we could do a, a couple of shows probably on fighting fish and before we begin let me just say that uh there are no concrete rules to this and i i get asked um every week when i'm on the water with people what could i have done differently you know you lose a fish what could i have done differently what did i do wrong nothing <laughs> you got to remember you never know how that hook is in the fish sometimes you're going to lose them that is just the nature of what we're doing. We're using a very small hook. Um, we don't get a, a pure hook set every time. That hook could be on the outside of the lip. It could be on the opposite side of the, of the fish from where you're fighting. So when you put pressure on it, it's actually working its way out. You don't know these things. Uh, the other thing is the fish is trying to get rid of it. So, you know, sometimes they accomplish this. Sometimes they win. You know, one of my favorite quotes, uh, I forget who the NFL player was, but they, they asked him about, you know, how come you couldn't beat so-and-so? And, and he said, well, they're trying to. Uh, you know, it's the same with the fish. The fish are trying to. And uh, they don't know it's a game. So sometimes you don't get them in. But there are some ways to Im improve your odds, okay? Minus the fact that you don't know what kind of hook set you have. You, there's no way to tell that. So you have to fight them as if you know you have a good hook set. Don't question that. Don't let up on them. I always tell guys, get the fish in as soon as you possibly can. Now, if they make a run, you've got to let them do it. But for the most part, you've got to play a fish like you've got that thing in the roof of their mouth and it's not going anywhere. That's the way to um, not only save the fish, but you'll get a lot of fish in uh, the quicker that you, that you can land them. The longer the fight goes on, the less chance you have of landing a trout uh, for several reasons. Number one, they're doing everything they can to get rid of the hook. Number two, the more they fight, the more they open that hole up. Now, one of the reasons that I really like the barbless hooks uh, from Kevin, and we're gonna talk about this next week, I'm sure, is the fact uh, of the way that the hook is designed, it's almost like a circle hook. You've got a little beak on the fly, on the hooks, and the spear is longer. You've got a, uh, a longer spear, which means you get a little bit deeper. If you've watched any of the videos uh, in the 30 days series, you're going to see a lot of times where I have to get the forceps out to get these, these hooks out because they're buried so deep in the fish. Um, there's no barb on these. And one of the things that I really like about this is when you have a barb on a hook, even if you mash it down, that makes the hole wider, which doesn't hold the hook as well. So these, uh, these barbless hooks, uh, Hanuk in particular is my favorite. Um, they go in and they stay in and you don't lose a whole lot of fish with these because of the, of the hook. Now there are lots and lots of really poor designs, in my opinion, of hooks on the market. Um, and I'm going to show you this next week. I, I may even do a, a video on the site with this, but I want to show you what happens when you tie a piece of tippet to the hook eye and you pull it against the fish. There are some designs that as you put tension on that fish, 
you're actually pulling the hook out of the fish and you don't want that. And uh, the fact that these, these hooks are popular is, is pretty surprising to me. But um, I've done a lot of research with this because when I went to the barbless hook, my, my hook sets and retention of the fish doubled easily. And uh, I could not believe it. And, and mostly with my guiding, I was able to see, you know, guys hooking a fish when they're nymphing. Um, we lost very few fish. And I'm convinced it's because of the design of the hook. So when you're fighting a fish, you don't want to have to worry about that hook coming out because what's most important when you're fighting them is putting pressure on them. So let's get into that a little bit. The more pressure that you can put on a trout, the better shot you have at landing them. Now I do this a few times a year. Um, I'll have a guy that will have a 14 inch fish on, which is a healthy fish in the little J. Um, and with that current, there's a lot of weight there, but that should not be a 15 minute fight. Um, if you ever hold your rod and we see this a lot, I do it a lot. If you just hold your rod up, and you're using the tip to fight the fish, um, you are putting no pressure on that fish. Now, I typically do that with anything that's under 14 or 15 inches because you can guide the fish. You can control the fish with a high rod, but you're not really putting pressure on that fish. And to do this, uh, to, to understand what I'm saying, tie your tip it, tie a piece of 4X tippet to a doorknob and grab your rod and just hold up on it and try to break that tippet. You'll break your rod before you break 4X tippet. <laughs> it's, it's pretty amazing. You put very, very little pressure on a fish that way. If you want to put pressure on a fish, you've got to fight him from the butt. Now, I met... Um, a friend of mine at one of the shows who was into the, the big saltwater stuff and uh, tarpon and sailfish and things like that. And Jake Jordan is his name. If you've ever, uh, if you go to the Somerset fly fishing show, go watch his presentation on how to fight fish. Jake doesn't bend the rod at all. He points the rod at the fish and basically pulls with the reel and he'll land 600 pound fish in less than an hour. Um, I listen to Lefty all the time. I had a friend of mine show Lefty a picture of a hundred pound tarpon that he took three and a half hours to get in. And Lefty said, that's a 15 minute fish. <laughs> so it's really about knowing when to pressure the fish and how to pressure the fish. You cannot pressure a trout with a trout rod with the rod up in the air. It puts no pressure on them. You can guide them, um, which is valuable. And like I said, anything under 14 or 15 inches, I'll stick the rod up there and I'll just guide the fish to me. Remember, what breaks tippet is a sudden surge. So if they make a sudden surge, give them a little bit of line. But really what happens when you've got that rod up in the air, your tippet protection is the flex of that rod. And it doesn't really matter how fast the rod is. If it's a soft fiberglass rod, um, you've got a little more protection. If it's a what they call a fast rod and it's stiff, you've still got lots of tippet protection, particularly with something like 4X. I would challenge you to, uh, to, to hold a fly, have a friend hold the fly, and just stick your rod up in the air and see if you can break 4X tippet. It is really, really tough. Um, you've got a lot of pressure that you can put on a fish that way. So when you're fighting a trout, I always immediately go up with the rod. That's my holding pattern, so to speak. I wanna see what the fish is going to do, how he's gonna react, try to gauge how much the fish weighs, um, that is sort of the feeling out period. I want to feel that fish out, see what he's going to do. 
every fish is different as you know you've you've had multiple fish days some fish go absolutely berserk and go downstream on you other fish sort of just stay right in front of you and, and bear down on the bottom every fish is different so you want to get a feel for them first thing you want to do get the rod high make sure you've got a good hook set you know try to feel that hook set sometimes you can do that and just see what he's going to do once you sort of get a feel for that fish put some heat on him bend that rod into the butt bring the tip down a little bit and bend you want to use the butt of the rod or at least the middle of the rod to start to move them. And what I try to do is keep the fish off balance. Guys talk all the time about uh, making a fish try to stay upright. When you take them off balance, it wears them out quick. If they run one way, pull the other. If they run the other way, pull the other way. Um, turn them around, flip them over, make them do all sorts of things. If they have to struggle to keep their their uh, orientation in the water you can wear them out very quickly if they jump if a trout jumps it takes a ton of energy out of them you should be able to skip them right across the surface after that um i always heard the uh the saying that you know brown trout don't jump well if you've watched any of our videos you see there's a lot of brown trout that jump and so when they do that you'll often see me skip them right across the surface after that um I don't mess around with them. Even at the bigger fish, I don't mess around. I, I just get them in as quickly as I can. And remember, once you get their head to the surface, you've won. They have no leverage when their head's at the surface. Don't give it back to them. I tell guys all the time when I'm guiding, I'm trying to net the fish and they get the head up and I just say, keep it up, keep it up, keep it there. And they give them their head back and boom, they're right back out into the current and the fight's on all over again. So. Once they get their head to the surface, keep it there. That is probably the most important thing when it comes to landing trout. Um, steelhead a little bit differently. I, I, you know, you might want to beach a big steelhead, but for trout, you don't want to beach them. Um, get their head up. If you're going to hold them in your hand, if you're going to cup them, try not to go over their back with your thumb. A lot of times that'll freak them out. Once they feel that something is around them, they start to wiggle. If you can just cup them in your hand with an open hand, uh, oftentimes they'll just they'll let you do whatever you want to them. Uh, I hear guys talk about turning them upside down. That disorients a trout, uh, a brown trout. Uh, if you turn them upside down, a lot of times they'll freeze to get the hook out. Uh, I saw some. Uh, talk on a local um, forum about somebody worried about their skeletal structure. Uh, it, I don't think it, it makes any difference to a trout that way, but I can tell you when you turn a brown trout upside down, oftentimes it disorients them and they'll freeze and they're a little easier to work on, get the hook out, etc. cetera. Um, so you can give that a shot. I oftentimes like to, if I usually fish a three nymph rig. If they're on the last nymph um, and I'm not worried about a tangle, a lot of times I'll just reach down and try to grab that nymph and, and shake it out of their mouth. Uh, I, or I'll, I'll uh, cradle the fish. If it's a bigger fish and he's on one of the other nymphs, he's up into the rig a little bit, I'll pull the net out and I'll net him. But uh, <clears throat> once you get their head up, you've basically won. So keep that in mind. Don't give them their head back once you get them up there. And releasing the fish, um, you really want current. Uh, you don't want to put them in really fast current, but you want moving water to move through their gills. Just hold them into the current, support them a little bit till they get their uh, their bearings back. Sometimes they, they just want to get a little energy, uh, depending on what the fight was like but you want to put them in moving water and try not to put them in muddy water a lot of times i see guys they're, they're they've moved into still water to land the trout or to maybe get a picture and in that still water they've kicked up a lot of mud and they release the trout in there it's not really good for them so take them back out get them into some moving water face them in the current sometimes it helps to move them back and forth get some uh, flow over their gills 
but uh, they'll take off eventually. And uh, that is generally the best way to do that. Keep your uh, comments coming to me. I always appreciate hearing from everyone. Uh, I'm going to move, move on here a little bit. Uh, one note for my wife's fantastic business uh, this holiday season. If you are feeling lethargic, if you're always tired, if you don't feel like you had the energy that you used to have, do what I did and get on the Lifelong Vitality Pack. This is amazing. It'll make you feel 10 times better. This is a, a product made by a company that my wife represents called doTERRA. It is awesome. I can tell you personally, um, I haven't felt as good as I feel now since I was in my 20s. In fact, I hadn't slept through an entire night since I was in my 20s until I started taking this. It is all natural. There's a 100% money back guarantee. I can promise you, you will feel better within a week of taking this, uh, this vitamin pack. It is amazing. Give my wife a call at 814-932-5716 or send me an email and uh, we'll be happy to uh, talk to you about it. How about fighting fish in fast water? Good question, Bill. If a big fish or even any fish really gets into fast water and starts to go downstream on you, move with it. You've got to move with it. When I had, uh, I had Troy Palomalo out a number of years ago and we were on the, on the little J and he hooked a huge fish. It got downstream on him in heavy current and snapped his rod in half. And Troy looked at me and he said, what should I have done? And I said, you have four, four speed. You should have went with him. <laughs> so you got to move with those fish. They've got the current on their side. Um, you you want to move with them. What I try to do with those fish is put side pressure on them, get them out of the fast current, get them into the current that you're standing in or find a place that's got less current to land them. So you've got to manage that a little bit. And it really, when you're fighting fish, if you're in a position in the river that um, you understand is going to be tough, if you hook a fish and you're in fast water, you've got to have a plan to land those fish. So if generally, if, they're, if it's a 10 or 12 or even a 14 inch fish, you can land them where you are. But if you get a better fish than that, you've got to have a plan. So think about that before you start fishing, uh, you hook a good one. You want to know where you're going to take them and uh, stay, ahead of, <clears throat> stay ahead of that. You don't want to be in reaction mode when you've got a fish on. You want to be proactive. So uh, good question, Bill. Can't believe it, but uh, we're, we're running short on time. Um, I wanted to talk about fishing in the winter, and maybe we'll save that for, uh, for next week. I do want to tell you, um, I am planning a tying and fishing weekend uh, at the lodge. It'll be the same price as all the other deals. It's going to be a, a $600 deal. You come in on Friday night, uh, or on Friday during the day, rather. We fish Friday, Saturday, and you leave Sunday afternoon. Uh, all meals, all lodging, all fishing is included. I'm thinking of uh, January 9th, 10th, and 11th. Let me know your thoughts if you're interested. This will be a combination tying and fishing uh, weekend where we are going to get into, I've had lots of questions recently about hackle. And, uh, excuse me, so my thought was um, the tying is going to be inclusive uh, of, of many different types, dry flies, nymphs, soft tackles, streamers. Uh, I want to touch on a little bit of everything and then half the day we'll be fishing. So if you're interested in that, give me a call 814-505-4568 or send me an email at epstraup at gmail.com. We actually thought about doing it prior to Christmas and I would not be opposed to that. Um, it looks like our steelhead trip next week is going to go. Um, we were scheduled to go up to, to uh, the Buffalo area when they got the seven feet of snow uh, a little over a week ago, 
and uh, we were able to reschedule it and it looks like it's going to be okay up there. So uh, I'm going to be out of commission from the 10th to the 14th. But if anyone's interested in doing it uh, between then and Christmas, by all means, let me know and I'll see if we can get a group of people. We've got right now about a dozen folks who have expressed an interest in this. Uh, let me know what your dates are, what you're available to. But my initial thought right now is January 9th, 10th, and 11th. Uh, something, it'll be after the holidays, we can get out. And I'm going to try to work something out with Kevin Compton so that uh, we can have him be involved as well. I don't know what the show schedule is. Uh, I am not doing any of the shows. For everyone who's asked me, uh, they'll see me at Somerset. You will not. I am not doing the shows this year. Uh, one of the reasons I'm doing this show, so I don't have to do that. I don't particularly enjoy uh, the travel and the hotel life and everything else. I like seeing everybody, but uh, I would much rather stay at home with the with my boys <laughs> and my lovely wife. So stay in touch with me. Get out and do some fishing. Uh, as I mentioned last week on the show, I was out Monday and Tuesday guiding, and it was phenomenal. So get out and do some fishing. Stay in touch with me. Um, let me know what you're having success with. And until next week, good fishing.